David once said, when I was growing up, I thought the point of life was to build the biggest database of information about God that I could. So he did. He went to church, he read his Bible, he studied at a Bible college. He stuffed as much information into himself as possible, but his spiritual life became unbearably dry. The problem is that no one relates to a database. No one develops a friendship with information. You can't get cold, close to cold, disconnected facts or trust them. As his relationship with the Lord grew colder, it affected his relationships with people as well because he treated them in the same way, as objects to study instead of people to love. I long for people to see and experience Jesus in ways that they haven't experienced him before, not just learn things about him, I want to see them recognize what's gotten in the way of being friends with Jesus. What's kept them from seeing and experiencing Him. I love to see those unexpected ways that God has interacted with people here in the Scriptures and unpacking the experiences with His people now, much like we're about to do as we read from Mark's 16th chapter. My hope is that you will see and experience Jesus through them. Imagine, if you will, the surprise of a poor man coming to realize how rich they truly are in Christ. Or a lost man being found in him. Or much like John Newton understood, the blind being able to, to see again as we sing Amazing Grace even last week. Or the dead man to be able to say, I'm born again. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 16. I'm going to read the entire chapter. I know that it was odd, if you will, for many of you to say Christ the Lord is risen today here in the end of September. It's not Easter, but every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen. I mean, every Sunday we ought to celebrate the God who's alive with us and, and maybe come to expect some things of God that we don't typically expect of, of God because you never know what Sunday you might be surprised that God might do something. And not just Sunday, but for our conversation today on I Love Sundays, Sundays can surprise you. But Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 20. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. 
So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. Amen. Amen. So I recently heard about two college grads. They hadn't seen each other for a few years and they'd gone to school together, graduated, gotten jobs, got married, gone their separate ways as life will often take us. They bumped into each other, however, at a business conference. They decided to catch up in the lobby of their hotel for a while. They talked and talked and talked like old friends well into the night. Every once in a while, one of them would say, you know, we really should get upstairs to our wives. They'll be wondering what's going on. But then they'd get involved again and lose track of time. They finally went up to their rooms at about 2 a.m. The next afternoon, when they saw each other again, one of them asked the other, how'd it go with your wife last night? The other one said, as soon as I opened the door, she got historical on me. You mean hysterical? No, I mean historical. She told me everything I did wrong in my entire life. <laughs> this morning is historical, not hysterical. We're part of, of, of God's move as we gather together for worship with so many others all over the globe on Sunday, changing the very destiny and history of all of the human race. And what I want to propose to you today is a revolutionary thought. Sunday is meant to be the best day of your week. Sunday is meant to be the best day of your week. Now many of us grew up in an environment where Sunday was, you know, boring. Or it was a rat race, you know, where you got to catch up with everything you missed during Monday through Saturday and Sunday's the day you do it. Or, or maybe where Sunday was just another day, you know, the only day we have for ourselves, like people like to tell me, so I sleep in. Sunday was some folks a disappointment because it was supposed to be a day of, of rest, a family day, a day off, but nothing ever happened where the family spent time together. Or maybe the wrong thing happened, like you had to go to work or do chores and you had to, to labor and, and, and so uh, Sundays were awkward because it wasn't what it was meant to be. And for our culture today, where families are so broken and so split, Sundays have become an awkward day for some folks because we spend Sunday with the non-custodial parent. You know, because we don't live with them Monday through Friday and, and we go on that day and we don't even feel like we know our own mom or our dad and so it becomes awkward. Or even for those who do go to church, Sundays are days filled with this kind of stress. You remember these things as you raise children, right? You get up, your best intention is to have everyone get ready and go to church. And as you're getting ready, people are bumping into each other and nobody wants to eat the same breakfast. And everyone's you know, complaining about not getting bathroom time. And the kids don't want to wear what you've laid out for them. And, and you get in the car and you're, you're screaming at each other. And you know, as you're driving down the road, yeah! And you're trying to reach back and smack the kids. Shut up, back there. And then you get to church, right? And you get to church, and you hit the door, and hey, amazingly, everything's perfectly fine. Get on my saintly face, right? You know? And Sunday becomes something less than authentic and less than what God intended for it to be. But I want to share some things with you that God didn't intend Sunday to be any of these things. In the Bible, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath biblically was Saturday. We know that. On the seventh day, God rested. Seventh day being Saturday. We worship on Sunday because of the scripture we just read, which we'll get back to momentarily. On the first day of the week, when it was still dark, Mary and Mary and the other women went to the tomb. Jesus wasn't there. But our Sundays are meant to be a day set apart. I want to share some statistics which may be surprising because my message today is all about the surprise that Sunday may bring into people's lives. But here are some, some statistics that I think you will find interesting and, and maybe even some of them will be surprising to you. These statistics come from the study of secular sociologists 
who studied the benefits of church attendance. I thought it interesting that secular sociologists would study this, but they do. They want to know what's, what's the benefit. So I want you to follow along with these six or seven things that I have for you here and just, and just listen to these things because those who attend church regularly, listen to this, live seven and a half years longer than those who don't. And yet, isn't it interesting that some people say, I don't have time to go to church. Well, you don't have time to go to church and you're actually shortening your time. Seven and a half years. 56% of people who attend church regularly have, are more likely to have an optimistic outlook on life than those who don't. 56%. 27% are less likely to be depressed. 35% are less likely to get divorced. Higher, those who go to church regularly have higher average levels of commitment in partnership, in, mutual, in marital satisfaction, thinking and talking less about divorce, and, and, and even have lower levels of negative interaction in their life. And the last one is this. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this one, but I know this will strike some of you. Men, listen carefully. Those who attend church regularly, students have higher grades, typically, than those who don't. They practice better time management than those who don't. And they experience a better sex life than those who don't. Facts that secular sociologists have studied about church. Does any of that surprise you? No. Church attendance makes a difference. And what God wants to do is, is to really change some things. So what I want to talk to you about today is, is what is probably, or, or I might even say definitely, the most important surprise that ever happened or occurred on a Sunday. Because as the women come to the tomb, it's the first day of the week. And I want you to notice that it is that first day of the week. And, and they're going, and the scripture says, they brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, this was back before they had, you know, undertakers that embalmed bodies, that took care of all of that kind of fun stuff. So literally what the spices were for were what? To cover the stench of a rotting body of someone that they cared for. Because much like we understand from, from pictures and movies, these, these weren't in the ground in vaults with, you know, with caskets that seal this up. These were in just caves or holes that had rocks rolled in front of them. So, so it was open air. So everybody would reap the benefits, if that's the right word, of a decaying body. So the women are going with their spices to come and anoint Jesus. I want to ask you what you bring. What do you bring? To Jesus. They were bringing their oil and their spices to anoint him. And sometimes we don't have much to offer but our love for him and our willingness to serve. But what I want to say is bring it anyway. The women were bringing their spices to anoint the body. I don't know what you brought to church this morning. What did you bring? You know, you brought an offering for those of you that, that placed something into the, the plates that were passed. But hopefully you brought your life and your willingness to just say, Lord, here am I. Because not only did they bring their spices, but, but by bringing their spices, they, they brought themselves, right? They brought themselves to the Lord. So when you come to church on Sunday, are you, are you bringing yourself and saying, Lord, here am I? Use me. Here am I. Fill me. Here am I. Accept this meager offering that I have, O oh God, of my life, of my time, of my talents, and of my treasure. But Lord, here am I. And, and, and knowing that God accepts our worship, I want to ask you the question, what are you expecting when you come to church? The women, I'm imagining, just play along with this for a moment, right? Jesus was crucified, dead, pronounced dead on the cross, taken down from the cross, buried in the, in the tomb. What do you think they were expecting? 
a dead Jesus, right? A dead body. So, so here's what I want to ask you as you come to church. Careful with this, Pastor. Are you expecting nothing but a dead body when you come to this place? See, our expectation sometimes defines our reality unless God intervenes and surprises us with his reality. They were expecting nothing but a dead body. This is the first and most important surprise on a Sunday morning in all of history. Because when they got there, well, let's, let's think about this for a moment. I'm jumping ahead. Sorry about this. As they were coming to the tomb, they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? So, so what obstacles do you expect to find when you come to church and when you come to Jesus? What obstacles do you expect to find? What stones are there that need to be rolled away that block an encounter with what we now know to be the living God are there as we come to church and as we come to the Lord? You know the obstacles I'm talking about. They're, they're larger than these heavy stones that were in front of the tomb. Division, gossip, slander, resentment, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, griping, complaining, not willing to go where God wants us to go. What obstacles do we expect? Do we also expect that when I get there, because I've not had this personal relationship with Jesus and I don't know him to be alive, that when I get there, that, that he won't accept me? That my life is an obstacle to a relationship with God because I'm not good enough? Because if people knew who I really was, they wouldn't like me so much. And so some of the obstacle becomes we don't become transparent with one another. We don't talk to one another about the deeper things of our life. We live on the shallow end and wonder why nothing happens in the deeper recesses of who we are. Sometimes we're our, our obstacle. Sometimes we get in the way of an encounter with the Lord. Not like I talked about at the beginning about the knowledge like Brandon was looking for of God, but truly knowing God. Of having that kind of a relationship. Sometimes we're the obstacle. So what obstacles do you expect when you are coming to Jesus? Or when you're coming to church? What are the obstacles? Because the women fully expected there to be a stone. They watched the Roman soldiers. They probably had the stones, and then they probably had a small rock, and they had some kind of big old sticks, and they were rolling it, you know, with leverage into, into place in front of the tomb. And they, and they thought, how are we ever going to be able to even pour our spices upon the body? Because this tomb is in the way. The little bit that I have to offer, I can't even get to him with. That's what they were expecting. They raised the question. You know, it's the same question people ask it. What good will it do to go to church? It's the, that's the question a lot of people have. What difference will it make anyway? There are too many obstacles in my life or in life in general for it to make a difference. So I just asked that question. What obstacles do you expect? Because the women were truly expecting to find the stone rolled away. But verse 4 says, But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And I, and I love this. They saw that the stone had been rolled away. Then it's hyphen, for it was very large. <laughs> Shouldn't that come first? Like, the very large stone they saw, it had been rolled away. No, you know, sometimes we're surprised by God and, and, and we see God breaking through before we even recognize the, 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 the true scope of the issue. The women, expecting the tomb to be covered, got there, lifted up their eyes. And sometimes that's all we need to do is just stop looking down at ourselves and look up to, to, to heaven. Just look out and see. I've noticed this when I hike and I journal about this a lot. 
that when I'm hiking, and, and especially when I'm with my wife, whose, whose idea of hiking when we go mountain climbing was this. I think I've told this story before. Her idea is to start at the base, do a military march to the top, relax at the top of the mountain for a while, do a military march down the bottom of the mountain so we can get in the car so I can bring her to Kimball's ice cream so we can have ice cream, because that's the only reason to climb the mountain. That's Jack's perspective, right? And this is what I notice about this. When I'm doing that, here I am. Here's the base of the mountain, and I'm just marching along, and I'm just, you know, and I'm looking down, and all I can see is, is what's below me. Now, I like to go on mountain climbs with a whole different purpose in mind. When I climb the mountain and I bring my journals and my camera and I, I, climb, I don't even care if I reach the summit most times, I like to look around and see the beauty of God's creation, to discover a new path, to look at something that's way over there that I didn't know would be there. And to discover things that when I'm marching militarily, you know, through the, through the paths to get to the top so I can relax a little bit and then get down as quick as I can so I can get in the car and get ice cream because I got to reward myself. I'm missing the blessing of the journey. And do you know how many people go through life like that? On a military march, just looking down at their circumstances, stomping their feet and moving as hard and as fast as they can, thinking that if I just get there, I can rest. Don't you know that the journey gives you opportunity for rest? If you'll take the time to lift up your head, you might find that the stones have been rolled away. And there's some pretty large ones that while you're marching, you can't imagine coming up against. But when you look up and you see what God has already done, what he's already done, isn't it amazing that he's already done it? It's not like the woman got there and, oh, what do I do? God had already done it. But that's how we live life most of our lives. Whining about the stones that are in the way and complaining about it and never lifting up our heads and seeing that God's already rolled them away. Because we're just on this, I'm going to use this expression because it fits here because it's spiritual as well as worldly. We're on a hell-bent journey. Forgetting to look at all that God has done for us in the process of getting there. In the process of getting there. When you lift up your head and you look around, and like Brandon, you don't treat people as, as objects to be observed, but rather individuals whom God has created to be loved. When we realize the value of the relationships we're called to have, when we recognize the God who so loves us, not only did he give his son, but he rolls away the stones. Imagine the surprise of a slave owner on a ship, transporting in, in the days before these big ocean liners are today. Slaves who are singing these melodious tunes filled with joy and sorrow, but in the, in the bellows of the ship. While your own object your own objective is to make money off of the cargo that you have down below. Imagine the surprise of grace breaking through so the one who was blind now sees again. Imagine seeing that the stones of selfishness and pride and stubbornness and arrogance and all that other stuff and, and hard-heartedness and stiff-neckedness and, and all of that stuff. Imagine those stones that are huge, huge stones being rolled away because we've taken the time to look up and see what God has done. The hymn that we love so much, Amazing Grace, if John Newton didn't take time to look up, if he just listened to it and thought of it as nothing but noise, and that's how we sometimes encounter our world, he would have just stayed a stiff-necked, hard-hearted slave trader. Here's the scoop that we, we don't even, if you don't know the full history, understand. Even after he got that kind of awakening, it took him a long time to get out of the trade. God's got to break some stuff off of our life, right? So the stone had been rolled away, but God still had some work to do. Do you know it's okay for God to take some time to work in our life? How have you been surprised? Maybe you have a story. And, I, and I, want, I want you to think about it. And those of you that are part of the small group, I hope you'll, you'll come back and talk about some of these things. What stones has God rolled away in your life? 
What stones has he rolled away? It's important to tell that story. Think about how important this is to us, right? We read it every year. We look forward to Easter Sunday. People that don't come to church look forward to hearing the story of the stone being rolled away. Jesus not being there. What stories of surprise have you discovered in your journey to God? And so they, 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 the stones rolled away. They entered the tomb. They saw a young man clothed in the long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Now, have you ever been surprised by some people you've met in your life? For good and for bad, but I'm talking about for good now. I'm talking about those people that you meet that there's automatically like a kindred spirit. You don't know what it is, but you're just attracted to them, and then you kind of come to find out later that you share Christ, or there's something that you have in common that's around the things of the spirit. God's done something here. This young man sitting in the tomb. Now, I want you to, to recognize that Mary and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, they had to go in. When we stay on the outside of relationship, outside of seeking after God, when we stay on the outside, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy right there. When you say something like, ah, oh, it'll never, church won't make a difference for me. And you don't go to church. No difference in your life. When you talk about, from a distance, the, the intellectual facts about the things of God, but you don't go seeking after God for yourself. When you don't go in. We, we talk about the setup of the temple, right? The temple was set up with an outer court, an inner court, and then the Holy of Holies. Lots of activity milling about in the outer court. That's where people would be selling their wares and, you know, all of the stuff that we read about that Jesus got upset about, about flipping over the tables. Lots of activity in the outer court. But those who go in encounter God. And for those of us who have a New Testament understanding, not only can we go to the inner court and hear somebody else tell us about God, because that's what Sunday is. You're coming to the inner court. But what I want to encourage you to do is to go further for yourself, because Jesus invites you into the very Holy of Holies. Remember a couple of weeks ago I talked about that the temple veil was torn in two on the day of his crucifixion. The high priest was the only person who once a year could go into the Holy of Holies, the very dwelling place of God himself. But God says you have access now. Not only do you have access, but he says you can come confidently or boldly before the throne room of grace from whence you shall find help in time of trouble. You don't need me to do it. You can do it for yourselves because God has made it accessible for you. But isn't it amazing how many people still want to stand on the outside? Or maybe they've had a bad experience with people and they attribute those experiences with people to, to the attributes of God. You know, so you meet a Christian who's a crank. And you're kind of searching out and you've heard about, you know, God making a difference in life. And you meet somebody who's just, uh, just a crank. I'll just stay with that word. And so you decide, well, if that's what it's all about, I'm not going. And you never come in for yourself. How do you know who God is and how you might be surprised about what God does? Mary, Mary, and Salome went in and they encountered this young man sitting in the white robes. God wants us to come in, into his presence, and, and to have a relationship with him that's real and personal. But sometimes we need others to help us find the way. In preparing for the message, it's interesting because I read all of the gospel lessons about the resurrection. I love John's gospel account. And, 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 and in John's gospel account, it's amazing to me that the women not only saw the, the angel and the radiant glory sitting in that account on the stone, but then they encountered Jesus. But do you remember what they said about who they thought he was in John's gospel? Yeah, they thought he was the gardener. They thought he was the gardener. 
They encountered Jesus and they didn't even realize it on the way. Don't you think they were surprised to find out that the one who they thought was the gardener was the Savior? Right? So, so, so you sometimes don't even recognize the Jesus amongst us, but then you become surprised to find out who he is a little bit later on in your journey. Isn't that something? They thought he was the gardener. I would like to think, I'd like to think, that if I encountered Jesus, I would know. But the scriptures are replete with, with yeah, Bruce is shaking his head, and, you know, they just didn't recognize him, did they, Bruce? The Israelites who were looking for Messiah didn't receive him. Well, I think this has always been, if I were in Jesus' presence, would I even know him? Yeah. So that's sometimes why we need others to help us on the way, right? The women are looking for Jesus. They come into the tomb. He's not there. Now imagine the surprise. He's not there. First think about that. They're surprised to see someone sitting there, and they're surprised he's not there. Think about what that must have felt like, right? For the women that were on the journey here. They said, the, the man said, don't be alarmed. I know that you see Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He is risen. He is risen. Church, this is so much more than just an Easter story. See, we celebrate this once a year, but he is risen. He is risen. We need to let people know he's not here. Why do you look for the living amongst the dead, the gospel elsewhere asks. Right? And the world continues to look for Jesus amongst all the dead things of the world. They look for Jesus in the tragedies and blame God for world hunger and tsunamis and earthquakes. And, and, and then they make pronouncements grand and glorious, like God's dead. Well, that's because you're looking for God amongst the dead and he's not here. The Bible has already told us he's not here. He is risen, as he said. God's to be found not amongst the dead, but amongst the living. So we need to stop looking in the wrong places for God. So that we'll be surprised by his presence in our life. So that, that brought me to this point of asking the question, not only what news have you had that has surprised you, but have you ever been so amazed by God that you've been afraid to tell others? Like had a real encounter with him. Have you ever had that kind of an experience? Like, like I tell people all the time, when I start to tell my testimony, I have language that, that English doesn't do justice to, and my words aren't biblical words, but I, I, I'm in like a traditional setting, oftentimes afraid of talking about my experience with the true and living God because it would freak you out. Things like Holy Ghost tripping, and God wrecking me, and all of these kinds of descriptive words because people would go, what does that mean? Has he been doing drugs? You know? What do you mean God's wrecking you? I had one man that I used to tell the story to that he thought that every time a tragedy happened, well, God's just wrecking me. That's not what it means. It means he's working on my insides to destroy the things that are not of him so that all that remains is only of him. That's God wrecking me so that I learn to die to self like I talked about last week, right? I love the church because I learned to die in the church, to die to myself so that he could live. So they hear this news, he's not here, he's risen. See the place where they laid him. But they were amazed, it said, and they fled from the tomb and trembled, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were amazed. So, so when you get converted, and you get saved, and you, and you came to Christ, are you afraid to tell like loved ones because they think you're off your rocker? And, you know, are you afraid to talk to the people that you're in your coffee class with, or your book club, or you know, any of those kinds of things? Because they'll think you're one of those religious fanatics, and you don't want them to think that. Not anymore. Not anymore. And we don't talk about it at work because it's politically incorrect and we might lose our job. So we are afraid. Because we really don't, listen carefully, we really don't believe the good news. If he's alive, that validates every other promise that he's made. So while we're at work and we're afraid to talk about the one who saved us, 
We, we think that if I talk about it and I lose my job, how am I going to pay my bills? Well, then do you believe the, 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 the promises of the scripture that I'll meet every one of your needs according to my riches and glory? I've done it in a story that's very unusual. Didn't write this in my notes, just thought of it now. How many of you know that the cost of insurance is like out of control? We just got a bill, that, a statement rather, that said that debt insurance is going up $225 a month in December. Yeah, nice Christmas present. So here's what surprised me this week. Because we're looking at our finances and going, okay, God, we believe Deb's to be retired from, from physical therapy. She wants to do ministry. God, what are we going to do about this? So this week, before she went down, last week, I guess that means, probably like Friday, we get an envelope from her insurance company. Around, and this is my first one. What bill is it now? You know, because of all of her chemo treatments and, I mean, not that she gets chemo anymore, all of her MRIs and CAT scans and all that stuff, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. So we get this going, I'm like, what bill is it now? She opens it up, it's a check from the insurance company for $387. On occasion, we, we find that we're, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, he, so I thought she said they're going to send us a check. And no, there it was, right in that same letter, the check from the insurance company for $387 or something. Totally surprised by that. God will meet, because I said to Deb after, I said, see, God's going to make provision from unexpected places. None of us ever thinks an insurance company is going to send us money back. None of us, we don't think that way. You don't plan that. You don't put that in your budget. You don't even put that in your whole box. Because it just doesn't happen. Right? It just doesn't happen. So if we believe God, then we, will, we won't be afraid. But they were afraid because they didn't understand. And that's why we get afraid as well, because we don't understand. And so the women, they leave, they were afraid, and said, now when he, he being Jesus, rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. So, so he appears. My life has been, even before I was a believer, this is the truth, this is part of what I've always been like afraid to tell people I'm not afraid anymore. You guys know that, I've been here a while now, right? So it's six years old, having no real exposure to godly things and, and understanding the scripture or any of that, it's six years old, I know that God came to me in a prophetic dream or vision, I don't even know which one to call it, and took me basically to the heavenly places so that all of the hell that I went through for the next decade plus of my life, I would know that there is a place that is real called heaven and that God is, a, is who he said he is and he's not a man that he should lie. And I held on to that promise because God revealed himself to me. Now, some of you go, well, that's why you're a pastor. No, God came to me at six, not as a pastor. I, I want to ask you, how have you encountered the living Christ? Because he does come to us. Now, much like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we may not recognize it. Much like these early disciples that we're about to look at, we may not believe it. You know when you're in a situation and you think maybe it's God, this is Deb's famous thing. How do you know if it's God or the devil or me? Well, I know the devil's never going to point to anything that glorifies God. And I know our flesh is opposed to the things of the Spirit. So we're not really inclined to point to anything that's going to glorify God. So if what you're hearing is something that is meant to honor and glorify God, you can pretty much be sure that's God. But we don't believe it. Because we don't think God would come to us and speak to us in these ways. And make himself known to us. But he does. And how do we know? except to know him. That's how we know, is to know him. So where have you seen Jesus in your life? And what has Jesus done for you? He cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. I love that. Anybody here besides me have demons in your past? I don't care whether you think of them as literal or figurative, right? We've all got demons that need to be cast out. What's God done for you? What's God done for you? That's, that's really a, an important question for us to think about. And if you don't know, maybe it's time to come in again and ask him to do something for us. And to be surprised. Because it, isn't it amazing that even as Christians, don't you find this to be true? We're praying for something. Lord, please do this and such. And then he does it and we go, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. I mean, why do Christians who ask then become surprised when God answers? You know, I mean, is our expectancy so little of God that when he actually moves, we go, wow, didn't really think that he would do anything. Expect miracles. 
Well, this is why we always pray back to God, the Word of God. Right? If you're praying back the Word of God, you can be assured that you're in the will of God. Because if you're praying the will of God, I mean the Word of God, do you think God's going to contradict himself? No. Sometimes we pray for things, and, and this is always, this is a joke, this is not anything serious. But Lord, give me that pink Cadillac, and I promise you I will do, you know. <laughs> and God goes, well, then set Mary, you know, sell Mary Kay. Right? You want the pink Cadillac? Sell Mary Kay. Why does God really want to give me a pink Cadillac for? You, you know? I mean, Springsteen sung about it. Well, I think it was Springsteen, but that's got no real interest to God. Well, God will probably give me a broken down, green, 1969 Dodge Dot with no shocks on the right side, so the car tilts like this, that burned about a quart of oil every 10 miles. Oh, that's right, I did drive that car for a while. Forgot about that. And I was thankful to have it, because it got me back and forth to work, and it got the youth group in the car and going down to retreats on the Cape, and you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. But the attitude of gratitude is an important thing for God to be in. Because if you're faithful in the little, he can entrust to you much. Right? So what has Jesus done for you? Do you have that attitude of gratitude? And then, and then to, to have this sense of, I, I just, listen, some of you may think that I'm naive or idealistic. Simply put, I just take God in his word. How can I go wrong in that? Right? How can I go wrong in taking God at his word? If the Bible's true at all, and if we believe it to be such, and the Bible says of God, God is not a man that he should lie, why would I want to have any other worldview than the worldview that says that God is going to do what he says he's going to do? Why do I want any other worldview than that? Because any other worldview than that, you know what it does? It just messes with my head. And it screws up my life. So why do I want any other worldview besides that worldview? And because then I take God in his word, I probably do have what some people think of as more to say about what Jesus has done for me. But that's not because of who I am. It's because of who he is and the fact that I just take him in his word. It's easy when I walk it out going, all right, the results are up to him. Listen, last Sunday we had seven people partake of baptism, four people joined the church, and a whole bunch of people recommit. When we started the service planning for the service of baptism, I thought there was going to be one. I was still willing to do it. I don't think I asked anybody here personally, do you want to be or will you be baptized? God did that. And the same with the membership. God did that. Because I just took him in his word. Last, sat, last Sunday, Brad came pretty early. I can't remember exactly what time he came, Brad. But remember, the sprinklers were just coming down. But I'd been sitting outside for a while. Deb and I had set up. I'd been out there at quarter of six. We'd set up. We'd done all this kind of stuff. I'm sitting at the table. I've got my computer on. I've got the sound system next to that. I've got the keyboard for Ernie next to that. You know, it's 8.15-ish. Somewhere in that area, it starts to rain. You know what my prayer is simply? God, you're better than this. <laughs> it's my prayer. Because this is what I've always said. I believe that last Sunday was God's plan for us. And I believe, as, this is how I like to work. God doesn't rain on his parade. Last Sunday was his parade. The rains were coming. I could have went, oh, gosh, because this is what went through my head. I went two things. I went, God, you're better than this. And the second one is, who in our church is unbelieving God for this day? That's what I went through. Because it says, if we doubt, when we ask, we can expect to receive nothing from the Lord. So no, I don't make rain dates, I don't do any of that because I believe God, I take him at his word. You know what? It was about 8.30ish when Brad was coming, somewhere in that area, and the rain had just barely started to stop. Brad had been looking and he told me, you know, I think this is it from the weather thing. But my only prayer was, God, you're better than this. Wasn't it beautiful last Sunday out there? I heard some of you talking about if we were out there this morning, you would have been freezing, right? But God took care of the day. Because it was his day. So I just take him at his word and, and watch what God's done. Now some of you can think, oh, that was just luck or coincidence. I don't believe in luck and coincidence either. Everything's a God incident. There is no coincidence. And if your life is just a whole bunch of series of either good or bad luck or good and bad coincidences, it's because you're not able to connect the, not the dots in your life about what God is up to. And we want to help you in that, if we can help you in that at all. And so... Mary, she, she encounters Jesus. 
She goes then and she tells the others, he's alive. It says they didn't believe. And after that, he appeared in a form to, to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and they told it to the rest. And they didn't believe either. Isn't that amazing? That, that people can tell the same story and, and people can hear the, 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 the eyewitness testimony of those whose lives have been surprised by God's invasion into their life and, and they won't believe it. See, we think of doubting Thomas, but... They didn't believe. They didn't believe the testimony. And then Jesus appears amongst them. And I love when Jesus does that. Do you know that right now in the world today, he's appearing in the Muslim world without any preachers because it's illegal to, to have a church over there now? He's appearing to Muslims in, in Muslim countries and making himself known. And people are being converted to Christ because God's appearing amongst them. Jesus is making himself known in these places that we read about in the world. Listen, the world news is going to tell you all of the tragedies and all of the bad things that are happening because they're not seeing Christ and they don't believe Jesus. But Jesus is still appearing and making himself known. What a glorious testimony that is. So Jesus appears and says, so later when he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, he rebuked their unbelief and the hardness of heart because they didn't believe those who had seen him. So, so here's a question. If you've been coming to church for a while and you're still not believing, my question is why? Why do you still come, first of all, if you're not going to believe? But if you're coming and you want to believe, Okay, well, we pray for you that you can come to faith. But I think Jesus is saying, stop being so stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and, and unbelieving. Just believe. Just believe. The world says, I'll believe it when I see it. My adage again, for the church, we'll see it when we believe it. I really believe that. When we walk by faith and not by sight, I think our sight's going to confirm what our faith is already held on to. One day we shall see it. One day. God, you're better than this. So what, what, what is it that God has done for you? Where have you shared the good news of what God's done that caused others to be surprised? How many times do we need to hear for ourselves before we'll believe it? How many times do we need to hear that God is who he says he is and he can do what he says he'll do? How many times? So here's our kind of closing question for today. Do you expect to shoot Jesus to show up when we gather together? I mean, like, literally, do you expect him to show up? You know, and if you don't expect him, Jesus in the bodily form, let me ask it to you this way, because the Godhead is three in one, and one who are three. Do you think the Holy Spirit is ever going to be present when we come together in church? Holy Spirit's present inside of me. But does he come? When we're together. Sure. He's here all the time, but do we expect him to manifest? See, because the manifest of him we've seen. It says this. Listen to the gospel. So after that. When the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. I don't care what Benny's hand says and Father the Cookie, I mean Father DiOrio says. I don't care what any of those guys say. Listen, none of us are healers. God's the healer. Right? When, when healing happens in the house of God, it's because the Holy Spirit has shown up and healed somebody. When people come to faith, because they've heard the word, it's, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not because anyone's a great preacher or because they led. Listen, I haven't led anybody to the Lord. I just have the privilege of praying with them as they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit draws us to himself. Right? Do we expect the accompanying signs? Do we really expect God to show up? Listen, on the day of Pentecost, he showed up. Whew! Tongues as a fire rested on each one. Right? And they began to speak in other tongues. And, 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 and from that they went out and even the shadow of Peter passing by would heal the sick. And you know, all these crazy things. And we come to church 
and we go home, and we come to church, and we go home, and we come to church, and we go home, and we come to church, and we go home. The next thing you know, we're 60 years down the road, and I'm not really any different, but I still go to church, and I don't have an expectancy that I'm going to meet with God. Literally meet with God. Question meet why? with God. Huh? This is the question is why. Why what? Why do you not feel that you're going to meet with God? That's a great question. Why don't people feel they're going to meet with God? I wish I could answer that question, Larry. You know? Because the fact of the matter is, is I've heard it even here, and I've heard it in almost 30 years of ministry elsewhere as well. People will come to my prayer group that I run, and they'll actually feel the presence of God in a way that they don't feel it elsewise. Because I think a lot of times we just come not expecting God to like show up. That's, that's the language. God wants to make himself known. Do you know that? He wants to make himself known to us. And so do we have a, a, an understanding in a sense? And when God breaks in, this is what I want you to think of. When God breaks in, it is a surprise. Oh, this first Easter morning here, the, the women were surprised. The apostles were surprised. And people for 2,000 years have been coming to the place of saving faith in Jesus and they're surprised when God breaks into their life. And too many times what happens is in church we've stopped expecting God to, 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 to break in and to show up and to do something. And so we haven't been surprised for a long time. Except when you come here and I do something different every Sunday. Sometimes routines keep us, we always stick to the routine and the Lord showed up. And sometimes he shows up in the routine too. You know, but, but the expectancy that we have that we're going to actually meet with God, that God's going to show up, and he's going to intervene in our life. And here's what I want you to just see as we get ready to go forward, and I'm going to end with this as, as this happens. These accompanying signs that follow them, their lives will change. When you, when you come and encounter God and God breaks through, your life gets changed. I don't know what it will be that God will do. I don't know what it is specifically even this Sunday that you came looking for. But what I want to say is if God, if you'll allow God to, to reveal himself to you and you'll seek God and you'll press in and, and, and you'll be surprised by his presence, when you come into his presence, your life's not the same anymore. It's just not the same. So when we come and we go and we come and we go and we come and we go and we're not changed, that means that we haven't really allowed God in. Or we haven't entered in, as the case may be. But we need to allow him. And we need to enter in. Because he wants to do something. Listen to what Jesus said. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they'll cast out demons, they'll speak in new tongues, they'll take up serpents, they'll drink anything deadly, they won't be harmed. And they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. church that exhibits the power of God is a surprise today. It's a surprise. And yet this is what Jesus said we're meant to be. I hope that church becomes a surprise not just because of the, the trappings, the surroundings, but because God has broken through and made himself known. And lives have changed because of it. Sundays are a surprise. I can tell you countless stories of times I've sat at the altar on, on the other side of the desk, as, you, as I like to call it, where you are, and been here in prayer. Listen, I'm 6'3", I can't hide in the crowd, I'm loud. Have you noticed? <laughs> and sometimes you want to just do business with God in, in private, right? You, want to, you, just want, you don't want anyone to look at you, you don't want anybody to know what's going on in the inside, Debbie's shaking her head, yeah. Yeah, but you know what? Sometimes God wants to strip away that pride because I don't want others to, to see my brokenness or my pain. And I've been at the altar where tears have been streaming down my face and God's just visited me in ways that have so transformed my heart that it's made me who I am today. But we have to allow him to move in those places. Because he wants to come in and, and, and touch your life. That's really my prayer. I started off by saying, I, I, I long for people to know Jesus. 
and to know what it is that hinders their relationship with him. I long for that for you, that you would know the fullness of who he is. I want to pray with you. We're going to close with our closing hymn this morning here. Father, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for all that you've done. And I pray, Lord, that if there be any here today that are hoping for your breaking through, that, Lord, you laid upon their heart today to speak to me or to pray with another and to ask you to make yourself known. Father, let there be, even today, one heart that is transformed by your presence. For we ask it in Jesus' name.